Hey there, listeners. You just tuned in to the Grow Wire podcast, and I'm your host, Fritz Nelson. On today's episode, we bring back best selling author, podcast host, and former CMO, Christopher Lockhead. This time, he joins us to discuss his newest book, Niche Down, in which he teams up with Heather Clancy to deliver a narrative stuffed with stories about how legendary people and entrepreneurs introduce the world to new ways of thinking and solving problems. We dive into the details of the book as well as the overall journey behind writing a book, what it takes to start, how the editing process works, and the secret to settling on the perfect title. Lockhead also discusses what it means to niche down and why it's so important for entrepreneurs. One quick housekeeping note, in this episode, we refer to Chris's podcast title as Legends and Losers, but since our recording, he has changed the name of the podcast to Follow Your Different, which reflects the more recent direction he has taken with his guests. All of this and more is coming up next. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you will learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Fritz Nelson, the editor-in-chief of GrowWire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your journey of growth. Before we dive into this episode with Christopher Lockhead, I want to thank our sponsor, The Second City. If content is king, then funny content is emperor of the universe. Second City Works, the B2B side of the world-famous comedy mecca, The Second City, uses the same comedy chops pioneered on their legendary stages to create totally original digital, social, and video content. Want your audience to pay attention to your message? Second City Works content connects because it's honest, it's authentic, and it's fall down funny. Visit secondcityworks.com to find out more. I also want to make sure you head over to our website, growwire.com. This week, we have an article about harnessing consumer intent from Greg Zakowicz, our friend who's a commerce analyst over at Oracle Bronto. In his post, Greg explains how you can get to the core of what your customer is craving when they interact with your brand, then deliver on that with online content or tangible in-store experiences. It'll help you see your relationship with customers in a whole new way. Sound like something you've been looking to read more on? Go check it out on growwire.com. Christopher, thanks for joining us today. We are, this is your second podcast with us, right? It is. Um, so we're going to skip all of your personal history, which uh, is so the, fascinating. Yeah, well, for the sake of our audience, if you want to go back and, and listen to that one, um, you can do that. But today we're going to talk about your new book, Niche. Well, is it niche or niche? Depends on your religious beliefs. What I'm, do you I'm, say? I say niche down. but Do you say vase or vase? I think I would probably say vase. You say aunt or ant? Ant. Okay. But it's niche. I, I don't know. It, was, it actually wasn't a decision I made. It's just sort of what comes out of my mouth. And I have n- nothing against people who, you know, want to say niche. And right. niche rhymes with things that niche doesn't. Like one of the ones I like is there are riches in niches. But you can't really Ooh. say there are riches in niches. So... True. You could be ambidex- ambidextrous with it, I think. Okay. All right. Well, for the sake of this podcast, we're going to call it Niche Down. <laughs> okay, great. Um, <clears throat> but we'll say vase anytime we talk about vases. Excellent. Which might be never. Um, let's start with how, and, and this is your second book, right? It is, yeah. Play Bigger was your first. Yes. And how does the idea for a book as a writer, how does, how does the idea for a book come together? So my first book, uh, I had to get sort of uh, pushed or thrown into it over a period of years. Um, 
And that was a dear friend of mine, Peggy Burke, who runs the preeminent branding agency in Silicon Valley, 1185 Design, just was on me for a long time. Um, and and so, I, you know, me and uh, my co-authors, we said, okay, let's go for it. You know, I thought, I thought about her, her words echoed in my mind. Um, I'm somebody that uh, got thrown out of school at 18. Uh, and so when I started... Such a surprise. Is that a surprise or no? It's not a surprise. It's sarcastic. It's yeah. not a surprise. Um, and so when I started, my only options were learning by doing, learning by seeking out coaches, mentors, friends, and obviously reading. And I read a ton. And there were a handful of books, particularly when I was younger, that made a giant difference. And so Peggy knew this about me. And she said, you know, what's your life like if David Ogilvy doesn't write Ogilvy on advertising, by way of example? And I said, it's probably different. And she said, well, you have one of those in you. And I, I just didn't believe her. And I, I still wouldn't. I'm not saying that uh, Play Bigger is anywhere near that book. But she just kept on me. And so so that's what happened with Play Bigger. With Niche Down, um, Niche Down in a lot of ways is a response to um, Play Bigger. A lot of people said, well, how does this notion of designing your own category apply to your personal career or apply to a, a, a small E entrepreneur business as opposed to a venture back big E tech business? Um, and Jason Maynard actually was the huge inspiration for Niche Down. He was like, dude, you got to write this book. You know, there's the rest of the world. Not, all right. And so, so it was feedback from readers. It was feedback from listeners of my podcast. It was Jason. And, um, and I thought, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. A and we are at a time, you know, two years ago, the Wall Street Journal declared a crisis in American entrepreneurship. The Brookings Institute just brought out their most recent report in uh, June of 2018. Entrepreneurship in the United States is it's terrifying what's happening. And so I'm just someone who is deeply committed to hopefully inciting and inspiring new entrepreneurs and supporting existing entrepreneurs. And those small entrepreneurs, you know, the person who runs the local market in your neighborhood and the, owns three pizza joints and the lawn mowing company. And, you know, those are salt of the earth people who have great businesses, and I just really wanted to do something for them. So Niche Down is, is for them, as well as for you and your career. How do you design your own niche in your career? I'm going to steal one of your little podcast techniques from Legends and Losers, your podcast. Um, so if I if I hear you right, <laughs> you do that a lot. I, I know I? it's a really <laughs> cool little technique, clarifying what you heard. But in the first one, you were sort of unsure whether you could do it. Very much Which, so. Whereas a, a lot of us who may think about writing books think, I don't know if I, I know I could do it, but I don't know if I want to do it. So you might have wanted to, but you still didn't think you could. And then you did the first one, and the second one was like, well, now I've proven to myself I could. Yes. And, and the response to Play Bigger was overwhelming to me in, in a very positive way. And so... And then, and then sort of the world asked me to write Niche Down, as corny as that sounds, right? So um, the, finding the motivation and, and doing the work and all that was easy in both cases. I mean, Play Bigger was a joy to write. And collaborating with those three guys was an absolute gift in my life. And then the worst part about writing Niche Down was when it was over. Because there was that moment where we put the book to bed and I was no longer writing a book with Heather Clancy. And that was a giant bummer because writing Niche Down with her was one of the greatest experiences of my life. So why did you – so I, I mean I've known Heather for a long time. She worked at um, a publication called Computer Reseller News, which was part of the same company I worked for. Um, so I, I've, I know her. What, what made the partnership work? You seem like – sort of different personalities. Like describe her personality and then why that made that combination really work. Well, of course, she's a female person and I'm a male person, so that's a difference. Um, she is thoughtful, educated, smart, and accomplished. That's a giant difference right there. So we're starting with the obvious things. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, her, her, her journalistic background, you know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, obviously years and years at CRN, uh, um, Forbes, Fortune. I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? So an incredible, incredible background. And her whole focus for her entire career has been on technology and entrepreneurship. I mean, the whole thing. So her background was perfect. 
A. B, as I mentioned, Fritz, you know, I had to read in the beginning. So I read uh, CRN religiously as a, as a kid at 18, 19, 20, 21, coming up in the industry. And Heather Clancy, no BS, is literally one of the journalists who taught me the computer industry. I was a huge fan of hers way before I ever met her, and I never thought I would ever be interviewed by her, never mind write a book with her. I mean, I, I, she, she made a giant difference to me as a young man and didn't even know it. And then when we met, uh, when I was a tech exec and she was still at CRN, and she, you know, she would interview me on a periodic basis, we developed a relationship. I got to know her. Uh, I got to know her husband, Joe. Uh, you know, we would hang out together when I was in New York or when she was out here in California. And I was like, I just, I just respected and admired her. And then when I got to know her as a person, she's fun and she's engaging. But yeah, she is the opposite of me. She's more conservative. She's a lot more thoughtful. Uh, yeah, we're the, we're absolutely the odd couple. <laughs> well, maybe that's what makes it work. I wanted to talk about one other thing that you talk about a lot on your podcast and you, you write about in the book, um, is your dyslexia. You called something else. We're not going to say it on this show, but, um, how challenging did that make writing a book? So imagine if your spelling was so bad that every four to 12 words, uh, you you type it so b badly that word doesn't catch it <laughs> and you have to take that screwed up spelling and put it into google the other one is you know if you think about words like quiet and quite well i have no idea the only way i can know if it's the right word or not is to google it to see it in context and so imagine writing a book you know, in the case of Play Bigger, 270-ish pages. In the case of Niche Down, 125-ish pages, um, where you have to Google every four to 12 words just to get it right. So I need help to write a book. I can't write a book on my own. Uh, organization, I'm a disaster, right? So in the case of Play Bigger, Kevin Maney organized the book and put it all, you know, so the structure, the foundation of it, he framed the book. And, and of course, that's what Heather did. And I'm an okay writer, and I've been working on it for a while now, um, but I'm never going to be you. I'm never going to be Heather. And so for me, partnering with her, it was a yin and a yang thing, and it was an absolute joy. Um, and as a dyslexic person, whoo, hard, e e even though I'm partnered with a legendary journalist, still, you know, incredibly hard. I did, surprise, surprise, write some of the core content. Not It wasn't all just Heather. It was a lot Heather, but... Some of that core material was mine. And even, even the stuff that she wrote, we jammed on back and forth and, and all that. And so I guess long, long answer longer, writing is really hard for me. I, and, and thank you for sharing that. And I, I, I'm focusing on the writing of a book aspect because I imagine that a lot of people who are entrepreneurs, they want to share their ideas. They want to share their journey. They want to share their experience. So I'm going to take just a little longer on this. But speaking of taking a little longer, how long did it take you to write niche down start to finish, would you say? We started in uh, January or February, uh, late January, early February of 2018, and the book came out in July. Well, that's pretty quick. Though. It is pretty quick. Now, it's a shorter book, but we wanted it to be shorter on purpose. We wanted to make it as easily consumable as possible, and having written a more uh, normal-sized, if you will, book, I don't think 270 is a, a heavy lift, but and, and Play Bigger is a real uh, easy read, most people tell me. Um, but we wanted to make it as easily consumable as possible. A one plane book, you know, fr from San Francisco to New York. Or uh, a lot of people tell us they read Niche Down in one sitting or, or two. Um, we did a couple other things we can talk about if you like to try to make it as easily consumable as possible. Sure. Well, like what? Uh, two big, two big things. When you, the first book was published by Harper Collins, the second one is self-published. So when you, when Harper Collins publishes your book, they make all the decisions. Uh, you make one decision, which is the manuscript. Um, and when you self-publish, you make any decision you want. So, for example, we picked the cover. So it's not a shiny cover; it's a more matte cover because we thought that was more attractive. Uh, we picked the paper. So most people, when you self-publish today. From what I understand, they pick this very sort of bright white paper with the sort of very you know, bright black uh, type. 
Well, I wanted the pages to feel like the pages of Catcher in the Rye. And so we went with the old school, I don't know what the technical term for it is, Fritz, but, you know, it's kind of, if you, if you see the book, it's, it's a more um, yellowy, old school kind of page. The other thing we did was we spaced the book out. So, um, number one, there are very few big chapters, in the, or excuse me, big uh, paragraphs in the book, because when people see a giant paragraph, they go, oh! And then, but the other thing we did was not just keep the paragraph short, the actual layout of the book, we spaced it out more than a normal book. So if you open Niche Down Up and you look at it, it's very easy on the eye and it, it just, the way it presents is as super consumable. Well, I did that because I'm dyslexic, right? And so well, I wanted the page to be as easy on your eye as possible. As a dyslexic, one of the horrible things is you get to what we used to call the carriage return and your eye doesn't know where to go. And it wasn't until a teacher taught me to use a ruler to go down the page, because otherwise my eye would go to the, pa the paragraph, or the, excuse me, the sentence above or the sentence two below, or I, I would get lost at every carriage return. So anyway, we did these things with the layout of, of Niche Down to make the book as easy to read, as easy on the eye as possible. And people have told me they noticed that stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, it does make it easy to read for sure now just a couple questions on uh, more questions on this line because i'm sure people who are thinking about well do i really want to write a book and they everybody hears well how many rewrites do i have to do how many rewrites for each book play bigger and for niche down did you have to do zero. 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 we wrote the chapters and we put the chapter to bed and we went to the next chapter and then at the end of course uh, um uh reread the whole thing and all that also, I think the other thing that's important in both cases, and look, it's different styles. People do things different ways. We worked with our editors as we were going. Some people write the book and hand in a manuscript. We didn't do that with Play Bigger, and we certainly didn't do it with Niche Down. So we're working with the editor all the time. We had uh, a book consultant we were also working with on Niche Down, um, and we talked to her every Monday for that you know, six or eight month period, whatever that was. And so... There was a constant process of, of doing that. And so at the end, there was no rewrite. There was tuning and maybe we don't need that. And, you know, there's a little bit of trimming and all that. But it wasn't – the book was kind of done when it was done, if you know what I mean. Gotcha. And how consuming is it? Like is it 100% of your – 120% of your time? I mean if something, somebody's got a job starting up a company and writing a book at the same time, is that even possible? Yeah, it's possible. Um, it's not possible for me without a partner. Uh, and some of that's part, partially how busy I am, but it's mostly uh, how dyslexic I am. So I would say if you're an entrepreneur or somebody who's really busy, regardless of dyslexia or not, um, having a, a, a co-author, uh, particularly one that's legendary like Heather, um, makes all the difference in the world, right? Um, and then to answer your question... You know, it was sort of up and down, but I would guess, I don't know, maybe 10 hours, 15 hours a week over that period with with blips. The other part that made it a little bit easier is, so the book is stuffed with stories, right? One of the things we got on Play Bigger was people loved the stories, so we doubled down on them on, on, in Niche Down. And I would guess roughly a quarter of the stories in Niche Down come from my podcast. And so having the podcast there was great because we could look at the podcast and go, you know, this this episode, we should we should feature this entrepreneur. And then Heather would listen to the podcast and, and, and she would write the first draft of whatever that was. And so that I think was great source material that I think made it easier for her and, and therefore for me. Those are all great tips. Thanks for sharing. And we're going to jump into the book a little oh, bit I, Can now. I say one other thing about sure. writing a book? I think if you're somebody who wants, who feels like you have a book in you, write the book. Write the book. Go write the book. If you if you're called to writing a book, write the book. And did did you have any like, I mean that's easy to say, but did you have did you read anything to help you figure out how to just start putting words on paper? Or did you just no do it? I just, just did, did it. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've never been a guy that like buys like the course on how to write the book. I'm not that guy. I, I, you know, I, when I learned how to play guitar, I picked up the guitar, a friend taught me three chords and I went from there. 
But that's how a lot of, if you talk to people or if you do read those books, probably the underlying theme of all of them is just write. Just, just write. Just, just write. Yeah. If you have something to say, go write it. And don't and, worry about all these other little things. You can go back and edit it and fix it and make it all the structural things it needs to be. Absolutely. And I wrote years ago for CBS News, Dan Farber, when he was there. And Dan taught me a lot. And, and one of the things he said is, don't write. When you go to write, write how you talk. So I was taught by him and others over time to try to just write in my own voice. So all I was trying to do is capture the way I talk, the way I write. Sure. Yeah. Christopher Lockhead isn't the only one with a story to tell. In fact, everyone has a story to tell. And if you're a storyteller, you probably know Blue Mics for their iconic Yeti microphone, which has helped millions of people find and amplify their voices. If you're thinking about creating your own podcast, recording some voiceovers, or maybe even practicing your audiobook reading skills, then you need to check out Blue's new Yeti Caster, the complete mic and boom arm system ready to connect to your laptop, bringing the ultimate broadcast studio setup to your home or office. And that's what we use here at the Grow Wire Santa Monica Studios, and we really do enjoy recording with them. To get your hands on one of these setups, visit bluedesigns.com and use code PODCAST at checkout for a special price. And one other thing that, that strikes me is we get to talk about what the book is about is does the, does the title for you, did the, do the two books you've written, did the title come first or after you've written it or somewhere along the way? With Niche Down, the title was very clear from the beginning. I, I don't even remember a discussion with Heather about any other titles. Now, we had lots of discussion about the subtitle, and we brainstormed a bunch, and we worked with our book coach, and we thought about... So there was a lot of work on the subtitle, but Niche Down as the title was very clear. Uh, originally, Play Bigger was not called Play Bigger. It was actually called Category Kings. And our publisher at Harper... Uh, rename the book Play Bigger. And were you okay with that? Yeah, still. Yeah, okay. Play right. Bigger is a great name. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Yeah, no. And, we and, could do a little revisionist history. No, 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 no. And, okay. and listen, the other thing is, you know, when you're lucky enough in life to be working with Jack Welsh's publisher and she says, you know, I got an idea for you guys. You listen super hard. I mean, uh, you know, Hollis is a, an amazing, an amazing individual, you know, a legend in the, in the, book business so you listen Paulus Heimbach yeah gotcha one of the things I do love about the title niche down is I think that you sort of get it by hearing it but just to be clear can you give us your quick definition of what niche down means yeah so the big aha is the the people and the companies that are most successful share some attributes that are not commonly understood so if you think about whether it's the athletes or the politicians or the social leaders or, of course, the entrepreneurs or artists or musicians, uh, scientists that you love, that we all know, that we admire the most, and you say, well, what, what, what do these folks have in common? As you start to unpack that, you realize, um, well, they're unique. Um, they broke or took new ground. And they are, I'm very much going to use this word on purpose, different. In other words, they didn't just incrementally improve on what came before. They made an exponential leap of some kind. So, so this idea of the people who are different are the ones that make the biggest difference is a very big idea. And it, 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 there's a, an aha in there for me. So that's a big part of it. And then the other part of it is, um, as a result, they educate the world about their different. It's the niche or the category that makes the brand, not the other way around. If you read Picasso's Wikipedia in, uh, entry in the first or second sentence, it says something to the effect of he's the creator or the father of cubism, right? And so it's cubism that makes Picasso, not the other way around. And you have all this 
stupidity in marketing, and you know, listen, I think I get to say this as a three-time CMO, that it's all about the brand. And look, I, brands are very important. We talk about brands, but categories make brands, not the other way around. And so you have to establish that niche. What you do needs to matter. If I say to you, hey, Fritz, um, let's go to my favorite restaurant in, in my hometown of Santa Cruz, Gabriella's. What's your logical question you might ask me? What type of restaurant is it? And so you just asked me, what niche is it? What category is it, right? And so I said, oh, it's it's Italian-American. Oh, I love that, right? And so, so and, and look, entrepreneurs intuitively know, know this. If you look in, around America, virtually every sign for a dentist looks like this. Giant font, dentist! Small font, Fritz Nelson DDS. Because... They understand that the brand Fritz Nelson DDS is meaningless without a, a context called a niche, dentist. And so the niche makes the brand. And then the next big aha is it's the person who designs the niche, who teaches the world how to think about this area, the problem that this individual, th this company, this brand solves. And when the world sort of gets it, then they go, oh, yes, then I want that category. So, A, I get why dental hygiene is important. Uh, uh, then I start looking for a dentist. Then I shop brands. Well, then who's a dentist that might work for me in Santa Cruz? And by the way, my dentist gives me tequila when I show up. <laughs> That's good. That's a good niche. Um, one of the ideas you talk about and you've kind of alluded to here is category design. So if we go with your dentist analogy, you know, like how far do you go? Do I do? Am I Fritz Nelson dentist greatest tooth extractor? Like, like is the, you know, do we go down that far? Yeah, I think we do. So uh, one of my uh, dear old buddies um, is a guy named uh, Dr. Larry Puccinelli, and he is a dental surgeon, and he specializes in— He sounds like he might like Gabriella's. Yeah, he does. Uh, uh, we call him Pucci. P Pucci likes food. <laughs> As do I, and and by the way, I, I'm I'm you know I'm married to an Italian gal. I got Italians up the kazoo, and I live in a cuisine heaven. It's ridiculous the food in my life. It's a miracle I'm not 700 pounds. Uh, but uh, uh, Pooch specializes in a I forget the specifics, but a very specific type of dental surgery, and he's he's jammed. Because he focuses, he does one thing. That's it. So if you have this, and it's a complex problem, and all the dentists in the area know that that's the surgery he focuses in on, and that's he does the same operation all day, every day. It's like the brain surgeon who does a very focused kind of a brain surgery, right? And so he is known for that niche. And if you're a referring dentist and you have a you have a patient with that specific problem, then it's Larry. So is that? That niche that he has, is that category design? That's category design, is declaring um, who you're for and who you're not, and most specifically, the problem that you solve and why that problem matters. So you juxtapose the idea of category design, or you differentiate it from branding or personal branding. Um, can you explain why these two things get confused or conflated and why it's important not to? Yes. So if you look at what the legends do, um, they, they intuitively understand that the world has to, uh, uh, that the way the brain works is first I relate to um, category and second I relate to brand. I have to. So for example, I don't have kids. So every dime Chrysler spends marketing their minivan to me is a wasted uh, advertising and they can brand the snot out of the Plymouth, Plymouth Voyager and there isn't there's no way in hell I'm going to ride buy that car. On the other hand, I love muscle cars, so every dime uh, uh, Ford spends marketing me the new Mustang, that's a good dime, right? And so, intuitively, legendary entrepreneurs understand that they need to differentiate themselves around what it is they do and what problem they solve. And then if you're the first person or the leading person 
evangelizing that problem, evangelizing that category, the world immediately connects the dot and makes you the leader. And so the legends don't market their brand. They market their category and specifically the problem that the category solves. But don't you think they're – I mean they're ha- – like there are some examples of people who sort of transcend that. I would say Elon Musk is maybe somebody who is such a personal brand and that you now through all of the things that he has created, you can sort of associate the idea of category design with that personal brand. So why is he known? Well, I think one of the things he's known for is disrupting – existing stodgy industries so he's known as a legendary innovator right sure he's a different he's he's differentiated in that regard right yeah. but like he, so he, he makes cars the, he didn't promote a brand called elon <laughs> musk but ha, but has it become that maybe he didn't in the beginning the only, i would assert that he is not known for being elon musk he's known for um, he's known for Tesla primarily, and now of course SpaceX, right? So he's known as the pioneer of leading edge technology startups, right? So that's a category. He's in a category of entrepreneur, and he's done it with such success and at such scale that he's now being compared to you know, Rockefeller and Ford and, and you know many others from prior generations. And so the only reason we know his name is because he owns this shelf space in our head called legendary, innovative, entrepreneurial, super smart guy, right? But it's the fact that he's that, that he has a brand. If he was just screaming, Elon Musk, Elon Musk, you know, sure. we wouldn't know who he is. Sure. Yeah. But at some, you know, so one of his newest companies is called Boring, where he's he's making tunnels underneath Los Angeles. But you just kind of – I think don't you kind of know it's just going to be successful? There's a built-in assumption. That's not always true, of course. Sure. I mean Steve Jobs had Next Computer. Nobody remembers that anymore and that was pretty much a hole in the ground even though it built amazing technology and technology that ultimately got used by Apple and, and others over time. But uh, – and people forget, you know, I, I was on a panel uh, yesterday actually and, and one of the questions is, like, what do you what do you do if Amazon enters your space? Well, the first thing I said is you fight because Amazon is not successful in every category. And so categories make companies and brands, not the other way around. And here, maybe this will put a fine point on it. Um, Microsoft is the category king in uh, personal productivity suites with Microsoft Office. They have over uh, 90% market share, according to IDC, and that's been true for almost 30 years. Google... One of the greatest brands in the world has a product that most people say is, quote, better, and it's free. And they can't make headroom against Microsoft. And so in spite of the power of their brand, Fritz, it's the category that makes them successful. It's being the the category king in search that makes Google relevant. Let's talk about Google for a second and this I- idea that you started out with better versus different. Yes. And you use them – you use Google in the book twice, one, to, one for better, one for different. Um, and in different, you use search and in better where they failed. And since you've written the book, they've gone out of the business of social media, right? So they, t- so they just tried to do something they thought might be better and, hey, we're Google, so let's do it and everybody will come running and they didn't. Um, I think when you wrote the book, they were just sort of teetering on, on the edge of uh, I'm sure extinction. they read the book, and that's why they're they like, decided oh, yeah. to exist. like, oh, that explains it. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Chris has already – Christopher has already said this is done. We're, we're, we're out of here. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, but in, in terms of search, um, where, where they – in your book, you talk about them doing different. What did they do different? Because there were search engines out there. Well, so here's where I'm going to push on you. They weren't called search engines at the time. What was so Alta Vista wasn't Alta Vista Search or Alta Vista Search? They did engine? search, right? But if you remember, the category name was Portal, uh-huh. and the category queen was Yahoo, and Search was a f- a, f- a function a of function. the portal. So right, so that's the first thing. So 
it was genius to focus only on that. If you remember at the, at the time, uh, and you and I are of a similar vintage that we remember some of these things, um, it was shocking when you first went to Google.com because there was nothing there. There was just a little box and a logo on top of it. And it was like everybody thought that was crazy. Now, when how you, could that possibly work? There's uh, nothing there. Right. So, so they called search out and said, no, 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 it's a standalone category. And um, they begin to have an argument about why. That's point A. Point B, what really made them go on the business side was they invented a whole new business model called the auction model for ads, right? Nobody was doing that. They were paying for eyeballs pre-Google. There was no such thing as an auction, auction model. So A, they pull search out. They make it a distinct category. And by the way, I'm not taking anything away from the fact that they had amazing and continue to have amazing search technology. They do. They had a breakthrough idea around that. And we talk about the specifics of, of what that idea was, if you care. Um, so they, they, they actually niched down. They took Portal, which was, I don't know, 15 things at least. And they said, no, we're going to do this one thing. And we're going to be absolutely legendary at it. We had a very different, and I use that word on purpose, idea of how to do search. And we think the search problem is not solved. Uh, and then they paired that with this incredible uh, auction model. And, of course, the rest is history. I would also – I agree with you on that. And, and I would also argue that all the things they've done, all the new categories they've entered into, even though some of them have failed – are actually all tied to search. Yes. In other words, you know, even Alexa, you know, the, the, they they want to or not Alexa, their but their Alexa. version, Google Home, right? They they want to. What, what's theirs? What is, it, is theirs Bob or who? No, it's, it's Google Home. You say Bob Go was Microsoft. You yeah. Say Google Home. What's the weather? No, you just say Hey Google. Hey Google, what's the weather? Yeah, yeah. So there, I you know, Android, Google Home. Um, every Google Pay or whatever their wallet thing was, they want to know everything about you so they can eventually serve ads to you when you search. So it's mobile search and desktop search. Yes. They want to own that so they can serve you ads. Yes. And so everything comes back to that original purpose that Google started with. Yes. Right. So they just layered things on top of it. And so, you know, some people criticize them and say, oh, well, they're a one trick pony. Well, okay. But it's a heck of a trick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll take it. It keeps working. <laughs> it keeps working. That's right. That's right. Um, but n interestingly enough, they fail when it's not that trick. <clears throat> yeah. and But I also think like search was – I mean um, social media was just their way of trying to touch eyeballs wherever they were. Yes. If I go to the store and I pay for something with Google Wallet – then they know my buying habits. If I drive somewhere with Google Maps, they know where I go. If I search with Google Search, if I do voice-activated questions with Google Home, the more they know about me, the smarter and more targeted they can get yes. with serving up their ads. And, and that's the end game. So even though they failed in social media, it wasn't because they said, well, we can, do, we can make a better Twitter than Twitter. It was, we just want a piece of that pie. Right. And of course, they still wanted to beat Twitter. I'm not saying they didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, when there's a category king, uh, to use your words, then it's hard to upset that if you're not doing it different. Correct. There was nothing differentiated about Google Plus. And so uh, my joke about this is they should have merged Google Plus with Microsoft stores and that way they would have scaled empty. Explain that. There's nobody in the Microsoft Store, and there's nobody at Google Plus. So if you merge, you would have empty at scale. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> and then we can and, and we can add the uh, Amazon stores to that as well. You think they're going to be empty? I don't know. The, the ones I've been in have been empty. Interesting. But the it's, only Amazon it's early days. store I go to is Whole Foods. And uh, am I well, the only a person one. in the world that now when you go to your local Whole Foods, it's it, it's a little creepy. There's something creepy there now. Like they're watching you? I don't know. Yeah. I, uh, I don't <laughs> know. Up. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just the uh, Santa Cruz Whole Foods. Or maybe it's just you. Yeah, I think it's probably just me. <laughs> now, it's the Santa Cruz Whole Foods is weird, but I, 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 I'm good with weird. Uh, weird and creepy aren't connected for me.
I mean, I guess they can be, but <laughs> you, you can be weird without being creepy. <laughs> and I got a lot of room for weird. <laughs> <laughs> Which American company started with a guy in a garage, was featured on Shark Tank, and now has over 1 million customers? Hint, they're reducing crime in neighborhoods everywhere. Here's Ring Video Doorbell founder Jamie Siminoff with his secret to success. It's true. In just a few years, we've had huge growth. We've hired hundreds of people, expanded our warehouse, and we're shipping millions of units a year, all while making sure our customers are happy. I've had lots of things to worry about, but I never worry about our finance and accounting because we use NetSuite from Oracle. From the beginning, NetSuite let me see what's going on with my business in real time, from revenues to expenses, customers and orders, even HR. I run my business from a dashboard right on my phone. NetSuite has been my business management system from 10 to a team of over 1,000. And NetSuite will be my choice as we continue to innovate and grow. Go to NetSuite.com slash ring to see how Jamie scaled his business. You'll also get our free guide titled Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth. That's NetSuite.com slash ring for your free guide and the story of a great American company. NetSuite.com slash ring. Uh, one of the other things you do, one of the many things you do in Niche Down is you talk about the distinction between those who find their place in the world and those who make their place in the world. What, can you talk about what some of the big differences between those two things are and how that manifests itself yeah. into success? So I think when you unpack the most legendary people, companies or brands, they are all, um, they all made a unique place for themselves. They didn't just do what everybody else did, right? They carved out new new territory. So that's sort of the first one from a business perspective. On the more personal side, Fritz, you know, there are some people who do find their place in the world, who from a young age knew they wanted to be a carpenter or a doctor or a race car driver or whatever it is. And, and you know what? God bless those people. I am not one of those people. And it turns out, and I don't know, of course, have data about this, but when you talk to people, you, 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 you hear a lot of people where that's not true. And, and if you look at the education system in particular, our education system essentially is a lot about trying things, what works and doesn't, what are you attracted to and what are you repelled from? And then we gravitate to the things that we're attracted to slash good at. And so if you think about education, it's exercise in trying stuff on to see where you fit. And a lot of people fit somewhere, but a lot of people don't. And it's a, for some of us, it's, it's, it's a personal crisis when you realize like, hey, uh, there's no place for me in the world. And so if you're a person like that, you have to make a place. You have to create. One of my favorite examples is um, uh, John's Crazy Socks. I love that story. It's my favorite entrepreneurial story, I think, of all time, certainly of, of any, you know, recent years that I've heard. And, you know, father and son, Mark and John, Mark the dad, John the son, and John is uh, a person with Down syndrome. And what Mark said when the two of them came on my podcast was, there was no job for John because the jobs that are available to people like him are few and far between, and most of them aren't very you know, they don't allow for his creativity, his genius, right? Their joy. These kids have so much joy. Right. And so he, in our vernacular, followed as different. And rather than looking at something that a lot of people might have looked at as a liability, they looked at it as an asset. And he's the front man for the business. He's, he's the face of the brand. And he's the creative inspiration in the business and his smile and his laugh. And I mean, he's just, you can't be unhappy in a conversation with John. And so um, that's a great example of a niche down on, on, on both dimensions. Number one, they niche down on this idea of, quote, crazy socks, right? So if you want a white pair of socks, wrong, wrong place. But if you want snazzy, jazzy socks, right place. Um, so that's a classic niche down. And, and the other reason on the personal side, John, like many of us entrepreneurs, it was true for me too. Nobody was going to bet on my potential. I had to, right? And nobody was going to bet on John's potential other than him and Mark and his family. And they bet big, and now they have this incredible company. And so my point is, many of us can't find a place. For many of us, it's a personal crisis. It can be a crushing crisis. 
And I will forever, Fritz, be fascinated by when faced with that, what causes some people to say, damn the torpedoes, I'm going to make a place for me in the world that is purpose built for me, uh, particularly around a niche that I can dominate, whether that's in crazy socks or as a dentist or whatever it is. Um, that's a very powerful thing to do to take responsibility for carving out a whole new place for you. And one of the things Heather and I wanted to do with this book was not just provide inspiration, but hope, hopefully we do that, but provide some real meat for people who feel that way, regardless of where you are in your life or your career or your business, that we don't have to play by the rules. As a matter of fact, the legends didn't. Painting by numbers is a dumb idea. Staying in the lines is a dumb idea, right? Follow your different. The most legendary people in the world were different. The, it's the people who are different that make the biggest difference. But it's hard, right? One of the quotes we have in the book is from uh, Kermit the Frog. It's not easy being green, right? Um, and so we're trying to provide a roadmap as well as inspiration as well as a lot of great stories from other people who've done that. Yeah, and th and there are um, so many great stories in this book. Um, you, you talked about doubling down on the stories and you really have, um, like John's crazy socks, a lot of great advice, like think wrong. Um, I want to end with a, a couple little sidetracks. One is, um, I want to talk about, because I think a lot of the entrepreneurship of today is coming from the millennial generation. And you talk about how you make an observation that they may be less inclined to work for themselves. Um, and, and that you're worried about that. Um, why do you think that is? So we know what the data tells us. So if you look at the Brookings data, if you look at the MIT data, um, there's a number of things they point to. Uh, number one, um, the high cost of secondary education. So when you come out of school with 100000 plus in loans that you're going to be paying off into your 40s, you know, th that's a terrifying thing when you're 21, 22, 23 years old, right? And you're a lot less inclined to take personal risk and take on debt or take on loans, that kind of stuff. So that's point A. Uh, point B, healthcare, big problem, right? Because you say to an entrepreneur, hey, I want to I go be an entrepreneur, but like maybe I have a family. Um, I need to be able to provide for my family. Healthcare is insanely expensive. Um, another one, and this gets me really angry, um, Brookings points out clearly that particularly at the state level in the United States, the laws are in favor of big companies and disadvantaged startups and small companies. And it is disgusting to me that in an election cycle in America, almost nobody is talking about how we advantage small businesses. When small businesses employ more people than big businesses, when Virtually all the new patents, therefore all as an indicator of innovation, come from new companies and smaller companies. The fact that you know every major city in America is 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 bending over backwards and pooping quarters and doing everything they can to get this quote unquote second Amazon headquarters, and and governors in our country are not doing things to enable and empower startups. Those things are are things that Brookings points to in the research. And then there's things that, you know, you can just realize by conversations, right? Um, generally, y younger people today are less risk averse than uh, people were a generation ago. I'm not a sociologist. I don't know why that's the case, but it's a giant bummer. And the reason it's a giant bummer is, A, at the country level, we got a problem. All the new jobs, all the new innovations come from startups, come from smaller, high growth Smalley entrepreneurs. They, they don't come from, with all due respect, GE. They don't. They don't come from IBM. They don't come from those companies, generally. Um, they buy the ideas. Right. The other one on the personal level, I am somebody for whom entrepreneurship is not a theoretical discussion. It's not a magazine. It's not some stupid Gary V seminar. It's not any of that ridiculous garbage that's out there. Entrepreneurship for me, like so many others, was a way out, not just a way up, right? And so if you're somebody like me where your, your options are, in my case, a manual labor job or entrepreneurship, and you feel like you have something more to contribute, and you feel like you have something to prove to yourself and maybe to others, and you want to go for it, 
entrepreneurship is that the only way that I know of to, you know, use the line my mom Jackie would say, make something of yourself, right? Because nobody was going to hire me to do anything other than, you know, work in a hospital or mow lawns. And so on a personal level, Fritz, the self-actualization, the ability to create your own life, the ability to do work that is valued by others to build companies, to employ people, to create, you know, in my case in the technology industry, new technologies that make a difference for decades. And, you know, to be part of that incredible ecosystem for me in Silicon Valley. And look, I don't care whether you're making pizza or software, that, that power of creating your own life with your own bare hands to say, I'm gonna start from nothing and create something of real value. Um, that's one of the most powerful things a human being can do, and it's not happening. Well, let's give let's end by giving people some ideas. Um, what industries do you think are maybe ripe for somebody to niche down in? So I think there are niche down opportunities all over the place. Sure. I, I see them all the time. Uh, I recently wrote an article for you guys about one that I love. I hadn't heard of. My, my wife came home uh, a couple months ago now, and she was telling me about her day. It was a Saturday, and she was out doing her thing. And, uh, and she says, oh, and I had a really great lunch because, you know, food, right? We love food. I said, what would you have, baby? She said, I had a sushi rito. And I said, a what? A sushi rito. And it solves a problem that most people hadn't thought of, which is how do I eat sushi on the go? And if you've ever tried to eat sushi on the go, you know, you can get soy sauce all over your pants in the car really easily, right? And so they no created- No comment. <laughs> <laughs> they, they created a sushi burrito. So you'd say, well, is, is it possible to do, you know, niche innovation in the sushi restaurant business? Oh, probably not, right? Well- there's seven or eight of these things now, and they're they're kicking butt. So I think you can do that in in one of the the oldest professions of all time, feeding people. There's still tons of niches. So that's a simple example. In the technology world that you and I live in or have grown up in, um, here's the aha for me. The future is now. The future happened. Here's my point. When I was growing up in the tech business, there was one big thing going on. The shift from the mainframe to personal computing and then client server. That was the big titanic shift. And it was exciting and thrilling and being on the front end of that stuff um, was incredible. And that was a mind blower for years. And there was one big thing going on. Well, let's go through the list today. AI, machine learning, obviously the cloud, social, mobile, VR, AR, blockchain, crypto, uh, 3D printing, genomics, and, and there's lots of others. Right? Oh, IoT, right? Virtual reality, augmented reality. Yeah, VR and AR. Yes, all that is, all of it, all of it is happening now. A little girl with a 3D printed arm threw out the first pitch at a San Francisco Giants game in 2018. I just got back from Orlando. When I was there at Disney, not my favorite place. Uh, anyway, you check into happiest place on earth. Come on, not for me. It isn't. I need a lot more scotch in that place for me. But I digress. Um, when you check into a, a Disney World hotel today, they give you a a, a bracelet with a with a, a carbodingulator in it. It's a look. It's about the size of a fat quarter. Well, guess what? It's your room key. Great. So RFID, fantastic. Here's what else it is. You can buy beer with it, right? It is an IoT device that you use to do everything at Disney. You never have to touch your wallet. It's the way you get into rides. It's, it's the way you get into the park. It's all that stuff. And so what's my point? Oh, here's another one for you. What has more lines of code in it? Facebook or the new Ford F50, F-150? Well, since you asked the question, I'm going to guess the Ford F-150. Right. So automobiles today are not cars. Most people don't realize when we hit the brake or the, or the throttle in our car, nothing happens other than you hit return on a keyboard. That's what happened, right? And so what's my point? If you're in the technology industry, or even if you're not, you have to look at what's going on and go, hey, 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 this is the greatest wave of innovation in human history happening now. And so to get back to your question, 
today's solutions are tomorrow's problems. And so I would, whatever industry you're in, I would get schooled in all these new innovations and ask myself the question, hmm, if I was smart and I was me, what would I do in my industry about this? And in specific, look at, well, what does IoT and the smartification of everything in my industry mean? And what problem does that solve two, three, four years from now? And what if I'm the entrepreneur that solves that problem? And so I think getting schooled in all the new stuff and soaking in it and asking yourself some really big questions, where are the new niches in these areas? There are thousands of them. There's a literal if you They're will, everywhere. niche NATO coming. <laughs> yes. I mean, and even in stodgy old industries like banking, you know, that what a bank is, is going to be different. It already is different than it was two years well, ago. Think about GoFundMe. That changes every, if you're a bank, GoFundMe has got to be a terrifying thing. Sure. Yeah. And Venmo and everything. All of that stuff. Because, you know, if you look at microfinancing, right, how far are we from saying, listen, um, F the banks, let's go to college loans. Uh, maybe you and I would 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 invest in a student at a small at a lesser in, interest rate, and maybe maybe uh, five hundred people come together and make a loan to a student at half the interest rate that they I'll call them dirt bags for the sake of not using other words on this podcast at the banks are charging for for students on these loans. Is that going to happen? I don't know. Is that a good idea? Probably. But what I do know is if you're Wells Fargo, if you're Citibank, if you're these giant enormous banks who've never cared about any of us, they're run by, I'll call them not nice people with spreadsheets. Let me put it that way. Um, there are going to be new models that appear here, right? And I'd be terrified about GoFundMe and things along those lines if I was them. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Christopher, or should I call you the original Niche NATO? <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> Thanks for having me back, Fritz. It's great to be with you. I'm going to leave you with one final question. Have you found your niche? Thank you to Christopher Lockhead for joining us once again on this episode of the Grow Wire podcast. I also want to shout out to everyone who made it possible. Our sponsors over at the Second City, Blue Mics and Ring, as well as our editing crew over at Lampstand and our producer, Kendall Fisher. Catch you next time. You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Fritz Nelson. Make sure to keep tuning in for more episodes full of tips, tools, stories, and strategies to help take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time. <laughs>